Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we really appreciate everyone um, taking the time to come and, and hear this amazing scholarship. We're, we're very excited to, to bring you our second annual fall symposium, Crime and Spectacle, Theft, Forgery, and Propaganda. Um, as we just wait for a little, a few more people to come in, I'm going to give some introductory remarks. Um, so before I continue with those remarks, I would like to take a moment and recognize and honor the fact that I am presenting from Haudenosaunee ter territory, specifically of the Ganyangahaga or Mohawk Nation, an area which is today known as New York State. For those who don't know, the Coalition of Master Scholar on, Scholars on Material Culture, or CMSMC, is a platform that was born online, dedicated to helping emerging and established master scholars by providing a space to publish their work and contribute to the expanding field of material culture. CMSMC is a new organization and was created after we ourselves experienced the difficulties facing those with master's degrees in fields relating to material culture, especially during and after the pandemic. Funding, jobs, and other opportunities were, and they still are, scarce. Our platform is not associated with any university and is run by fellow master's scholars. Our online publication is similar to that of an undergraduate review. We publish bi-weekly, and we aim to fill a gap for those earning or possessing a master's degree. These scholars are often competing with doctoral students or established academics for publication in other journals. In, a year and a half that, in the year and a half that our site has been live, we have had over 40 articles published with more in the works. We've had almost 20,000 unique visitors and readers and hosted our first two symposiums last spring and fall. If you're wondering about ways to get involved or support CMSMC, there's a lot of ways to do that. Our Patreon offers helpful and exciting perks for those who join. We also have a store on our website, which is rather new where we are currently selling CMSMC apparel, including our original history should make you uncomfortable merchandise. We are completely funded by your support and any financial contribution is greatly appreciated and it helps support our mission. We will be hosting another symposium in the spring, the title and details of which will be shared in the coming months, as well as numerous professional development and networking events like our upcoming talk on, interview, on interviewing with Dr. Alyssa Butler held on December 8th. All of this information can be found on our website, as with all of our publications, so we highly encourage you to check that out. And if you're interested in collaborating with us, uh, we're, we're very interested. So for our fall 2021 symposium, we wanted to explore how history has defined by those who take risks, break rules, and challenge the very foundations of society. We posited questions such as how do we handle the material remnants of past controversy and tragedy? How does material culture inspire deep psychological stress on those who experience it? How can past and present evidence tell us about crimes and spectacles are endemic to society? We wanted to bring together a group of scholars who explored these questions in a wide variety of topics. Now, with great pleasure, I introduce our panelists for today. Laura Calhoun will start off our morning with her presentation titled Discovering Disingenuous and Spurious Art best practices for managing fakes and forgeries in museums. Her research draws from her master's thesis. She earned her, master's, her Master of Art, Liberal Arts and Museum Studies from Harvard Extension. Fakes are omnipresent in museum collections, yet there is not a national standard on how to deal with these objects. Calhoun seeks to fill a gap and provide a comprehensive best practice policy for museums when it comes to managing fakes and forgeries. She also earned her BFA from the School of Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Next, we have Francesca Bisi. Bisi's presentation will discuss Conquête Militaire, the ethics of restitution of the Louvre's Napoleonic legacy. Examining the origin of many of the Louvre's in initial objects from Napoleonic conquests, she highlights the issues of cultural heritage and ownership. Bisi is earning her MA in Art History and Museum Studies from Tufts University. She previously earned a master's in history from the U University of Edinburgh and a BA in art history and Italian studies from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. We will also hear from Yuma Tirada, presenting Money, Model, Medium, Model 1000 Yen Note Incident, 1963 to 1970. 
Tarada's presentation will discuss artist Genpai Akasegawa's work, Model 1000 Yen Note, and Akasegawa's subsequent indictment for imitating currency. Tarada argues that this work was not an anti-state strategy, but rather a way to visualize the cultural technique of money. He received his BA from Columbia University in political science and history and theory of architecture, and he is currently earning his master's degree from Columbia in modern and contemporary art. Next, we have Abigail Uplet's presentation titled Money Driven Villainy, Marketing the American Abolitionist Movement, which explores 19th century posters announcing anti-slavery conferences, rallies, and picnics. Eppelet argues that these posters, crafted for a Northern audience, are significant for a variety of reasons, including indirectly encouraging viewers to support the Underground Railroad, as well as upholding racial constructs. She earned her master's degree in museum education from Tufts University and has a BA in creative industries and creative writing from Wheaton College. Elizabeth Paulson will share Take Heed of Revelations, Puritanism, Spirituality, and Mental Instability in the Case of Dorothy Talby. Paulson's presentation examines the spectacle of Dorothy Talby's execution in Massachusetts in, in 1639. Talby murdered her three-year-old daughter, and Governor John Winthrop's account of Talby's trials reveals 18th century notions towards mental health and religion. Paulson is earning her master's degree in history from Tufts University and holds a BA in history from Carleton College. To end the panel, we will hear from our keynote speaker, Rachel Christ Doan, who will further be introduced by Mary Kate Smolensky later on. We will share a keynote address, she will share a keynote address on the topic of the Salem witch trials and public memory. Finally, before we continue with our symposium, I would like to thank our symposium committee. Perry Buke, Christine Staten, Reb Sue, Molly Radford, Sarah Henslick, Mary Manfredi, and Caroline Haller, without whom this would not have been even a little bit possible. Um, I, I'm just truly grateful for their participation, their help, everything that they've, they've done to make this the symposium that it is. So now, without further ado, I introduce Laura Calhoun. All right, give me a second here. Let's share some screens. Just a minute here. I'm having a having a little problem. Just a second. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Laura Calhoun. Um, I'm delighted to present today and would first like to thank CMSMC, Hope, Mary Kate, Sydney, and Sarah, um, and my fellow presenters for allowing me the opportunity to share my research. Um, I can talk about fakes for days, but today I'm going to keep it to 15 minutes. Uh, I'd like to mention that all of the artwork in this presentation is fake. So let's start with this painting that you're looking at right now after Martin Johnson Heed, and it's attributed to Ken Perini. And just to provide some market value context here, this painting went up for auction as a fake in 2016 with an estimate of $1,500, and it sold for almost $6,000. So this is just to demonstrate the, uh, the demand in the marketplace. So for thousands of years, art forgers have willingly employed their lucrative talents to deceive dealers and connoisseurs and scholars. Master forgers have pr produced work that's been vetted by renowned experts. It's been sold for millions and it's been exhibited in museums around the world. And in the past, when these spurious works of art surfaced in a permanent collection, devastated curators and museum directors manage the discovery with hushed authority and acute discretion. So today, museological governance is changing to embrace a philosophy of transparency and public discourse. However, the stigma surrounding fakes remains dubious in part because of the lack of procedural guidelines. 
So the end product of this investigation, this research that I did is a comprehensive proposal for best practices for negotiating fakes and forgeries for museums while maintaining alignment with the museum's mission. And at present, the industry doesn't have a proposed standard that offers a cogent and definitive guideline. So let's get to the fun stuff. How do these fakes end up in museums? So in order for counterfeit art to pass as an original, a forger can't solely rely on his or her talent as an artist. So producing fake provenance, buying erroneous certificates of authentication, falsifying lab reports, and manufacturing wear and tear on a painting isn't enough. To successfully infiltrate a permanent collection, a forger must be able to exploit the one loophole guaranteed to grant him access. And that's human desire. So a forger could target a curator's longing for an old master or a development officer's pursuit of a generous prospect. And case studies used in this research demonstrate that human desire is ultimately culpable for the presence of fraudulent works in most art museums. And in this section, we're gonna focus on three case studies to illustrate how forgers successfully manipulate the experts in the art world and convince them that what is fake is in fact real. So we'll start with Han van Meegeren. He was a moderately accomplished artist who worked predominantly as a portraitist for the wealthy Dutch elite. But after art critics had published a less than flattering review of his work, he just threw that away and joined forces with a painting restorer who happened to specialize in adding false signatures to paintings. They teamed up with Leonardis, who, uh, by the way, was one of the most fabulously dishonest dealers of the late 20th century. And Von Meegeren evolved into a forger who specialized in creating uh, original fakes. So these are works that are uniquely conceptualized by the forger, but meant to represent a recently discovered piece in the artist's own oeuvre. In one case, Van Meegeren's forge, in one of his forged Vermeers that he made, The Smiling Girl, he created this painting specifically to finesse a sense of nostalgia in Wilhelm von Bode. He was a German art critic and museum director in Berlin, and The Smiling Girl was painted to suggest it was a study of Vermeer's The Girl with a Glass of Wine. That painting was located in Braunschweig, Germany, which happened to be Bode's hometown, and coincidentally, Bode's first introduction to Vermeer. And within 11 years, The Smiling Girl would eventually find its way into the National Gallery's permanent collection in Washington, DC, by way of the Andrew Mellon Educational and Charitable Trust. So von Meegeren's career ended after World War II with his arrest for being allegedly a Nazi sympathizer. However, after some convoluted and fantastic storytelling at his trial, he emerged a folk hero. How? He confessed to painting Christ and the Adulteress, which was attributed to Vermeer, which he then sold to Hermann Goering via middleman. So now he was lauded as the artist who swindled the Reich. And Christ at Emmaus is one of the most famous falsifications in Dutch art history. And in 1937, the museum Boymans purchased this painting as an extraordinary Vermeer. But although von Meegeren wasn't as prolific as some, as, as some of his other culpable forgers of the 20th century, his paintings were embedded in several well-known collections and museums at the time of his trial, which was in 1937, 47, excuse me. And as the trial unfolded, the breadth of his fakes just expanded. So here, here we have this sad guy, Mark Landis. He's a forger who recently made headlines within the museum community by donating his fakes to institutions all across the South. And Landis' attempts at forgery are based on pure copy. And that's to say that his fakes are direct reproductions derived from an original rather than a pastiche or original fake, like I mentioned earlier. In, in the hierarchy of the counterfeit art world, Landis's talents are recognized as the least sophisticated compared with an original fake. However, as unrefined as Landis's aptitude for reproduction may be, 
during his career, five museums in the United States had accessioned identical portraits made by him. The same portrait five times. So Mark and his mother, they lived uh, together in senior housing, a senior housing complex in Mississippi. And here Mark began to copy paintings by lesser known artists and inv invent false provenances to accompany his work. And from this apartment, Mark would counterfeit enough paintings and drawings to blanket more than 50 museums in 20 states with his donated forgeries. And his strategy was really simple. He would target small to medium sized museums, predominantly those affiliated with academic institutions and present as a potential donor. The museum staff eager at the chance to cultivate a new prospect availed themselves as his audience. And during these meetings, Landis using an alias and here you can see him as Father Arthur Scott, one of his favorite aliases. Uh, he would offer the directors and curators a painting and the promise of additional work. And after accepting the painting and presenting Landis with the deed of gift, he would leave. But in some cases, he'd return uh, multiple times to the same museum over the course of several years and uh, bringing them gifts of fine art. So museums, like other nonprofits, are positioned to develop relationships with new donors or bear operating budgets directly tied to donor largesse. And it therefore takes little effort to get the attention of museum directors and curators, especially if the prospect comes with a promise of future bequests. Uh, and this is the loophole that Landis exploited in order to broadcast his forgeries across the South. But you, it should, you should know that what he was doing was not illegal. And here's Ken Perini from Florida. Ken began painting uh, without any formal training and soon discovered his talent for recreating Dutch old masters. In an effort to cash in on his lucrative aspects of his talent, he began selling his work at premier auction houses in New York City, like Sotheby's and Christie's. For three decades, he was able to convince the auction house experts that his forgeries were in fact authentic. And he found not only replicating the subject matter of period paintings fascinating, but the additional challenge of incorporating cracks in what he likes to refer to as visual forensics required to make it a convincing fake. So another challenge in the vetting process emerged in 1998 following an FBI case involving Ken and the alleged sale of his work at Christie's and Sotheby's. As, as Perini detailed in an inquiry after the auction house, giants discovered a certain number of paintings sold that their institution had been linked to him. Instead of cooperating with the investigation and possibly exposing the fraudulent behavior, Perini felt that Christie's and Sotheby's really chose to frustrate the investigation until the statute of limitations had expired. So the FBI had all the evidence there to indict but never proceeded in spite of a substantial amount of incriminating evidence. Uh, Ken to this day will not disclose if his forgeries have been accessioned into museum collections as he's often asked to do, uh, but instead he'll release a catalog raisonné posthumously to expose the scope of his work. And during the 1980s when production was flourishing, he created an extensive archive of photos to organize and monitor the location of all of his works. Here we have the Ford Museum as a case study. Um, they purchased the Brewster Chair, which was named after William Brewster, who was considered the spiritual leader of the Plymouth Colony in the mid 17th century. The chair is not known for its comfort. It's uh, made of turned wood and it's a symbol of authority and status. And it's uh, designed for the head of the household or distinguished guests. And Brewster chairs are rare examples of early furniture construction in the Plymouth settlement, rather than brought over from England because the chairs are made of ash, which is native to America. And the Ford Museum used the chair for the cover of their early American furniture publication and considered a highly prized acquisition. But in fact, the chair was built in 1969 by a sculptor, Armand Lamontagne of Rhode Island. After hearing that his work was purchased by the Ford, he sent an admission to the Providence Journal in 1977, claiming responsibility for the creation. Since then, the Ford has made the 
chair and the story of discovery available to other museums for exhibition. And in this case study, it's also an example of the price tag associated with the commitment of stewardship. For seven years, the Ford Museum thought that it had acquired one of the three known Brewster chairs in existence. While the cost of the chair was suspiciously low, I think it was $9,000, the accumulated costs associated with storage, insurance, and conservation were most likely, likely high. Furthermore, the decision not to deaccession the chair after its authenticity was debunked garners additional expenditures. And since the chair has now become legendary in the world of fakes, is there an option, is there an obligation to conserve it? Next, we have the, uh, the Fogg Art Museum. And so a letter in uh, the Fogg's Matisse Forgery Archive dated May 7th, 1955 reads, Dear Sir, I have in my possession several pen and ink drawings by Matisse, period 1940 to 44. I would like to know if you would be interested in examining them for your eventual purchase. You are sincerely, E. Renal. Now, E. Renal was actually the legendary former uh, forger, Elmer de Ori. And these uh, drawings came with the price tag of $750 for two. So the following year, the assistant curator of drawings wrote, wrote Elmer, requesting provenance for the seated lady with pomegranates, indicating this information hadn't been provided during the purchase of the drawings. And the curator was in the process of creating a catalog of Matisse's work, culling from both private collections and museums. So she was filtering the work into two categories. Drawings the curators thought were right and drawings they thought were wrong, meaning fakes. And the process took several years to complete and over the course of the exercise, the curators were surprised to discover that the scope of his deceit included prestigious institutions such as the Nodler Company, which was prestigious at one time, but we won't get into that, and MoMA. So in regards to fakes, Mission and planning promotes ongoing discussions with constituents and neighbors, to be honest and educated. Programming surrounding disingenuous objects, as well as printed material, will further this relationship and help control the message, which is key. Preparing ongoing tactics such as these will empower the community and reinforce education as a core value within the museum. And introducing the possibility of discovering a fake in the collection is best positioned under the museum's commitment to education and reflected in its mission. So in a lot of these interviews that I did with museums, many of them uh, preferred not to have their names known. So in this case, SETI Museum X um, will discuss donor sensitivity. And an example of this issue is outlined in the following scenario for Museum X. An alumni is considering a donation consisting of a dozen works of art followed by a significant cash donation. And the development office has been working closely with the donor over the course of several years in anticipation of this gift. The first installment of artwork arrives and museum's curators identify several pieces that would benefit the permanent collection. However, the remainder includes several pieces of poor quality work one acutely over restored painting and one shameless forgery. The donor stipulated that the pieces can't be deaccessioned and the collection must remain intact. The curators are now placed in a precarious situation and must decide whether to accession the objects and guarantee the future funding to the institution or reject the offer and sabotage the development office's efforts. And in many museums, smaller, smaller institutions, the governing authority, staff, and volunteers wear many hats. And the plurality of these roles can lead to shared responsibility and reporting. However, when managing fakes, it's important that each player has a clear understanding of his or her role. And when these roles are defined prior to discovering a problem in the collection, action steps need to, be, need to remedy the situation can then be dispatched. For example, it should be decided beforehand that the curator who mistakenly accepted the object not be responsible for dealing with the media. Nonetheless, present day curators are still responsible for managing the questionable decisions made by their predecessors. And a museum with a parent organization faces additional obstacles when handling a fake, particularly in the chain of command. 
An example might be a university museum that's received a disingenuous painting from a top tier donor and the university's development officers would undoubtedly prescribe a different treatment protocol for what to do with the fake rather than the museum's collection manager. So by creating a designated chain of command, the commitment to adhere to policy, the guideline for managing fakes can be executed with appropriate oversight. And collection storage in many museums is often described as limited, finite, and costly, and there's never enough of it. As stewards of public trust, and in strict compliance with policy, museums are legally bound to preserve the institution's integrity and respect the donor's intent. So challenges arrive when these pieces in the collection, when pieces in the collection are discovered to be fake and attempts to deaccession are blocked by the donor's desire or will. So in this case, in January of 2013, the Brooklyn Museum made headlines in the New York Times after curators discovered that a considerable portion of art from the real estate of Colonel Michael Freitzum was fake. So the collection ranged from early Renaissance paintings to Chinese porcelain and was bequeathed in 1932 with the Metropolitan Museum of Art having the right of first refusal. So after the Met came in, the collection was dispersed to, to the executors of the estate and then they allowed the Brooklyn Museum of Art to accession the rest. And a total of 926 pieces were added to the museum's collection, which is substantial. And 90 years later, the museum is attempting to deaccession 229 of them. These objects have been declared misrepresentations, misattributions, or of dubious authorship. So unfortunately for the museum, the art can't, can't be legally removed from the collection based on the provisio that if pieces in the collection are to be sold, the executors of the will must be notified. And unfortunately, they're all dead. So the AAM, the American Alliance of Museums, recommends that museums set strategies when shaping the ideal collection. And these strategies present an overview of how the museum will manage any ruptures in that collection, such as the discovery of a fake. A basic plan of action would include both internal and external approaches. An internal strategy would be to identify storage options for spurious works in an effort to reduce costs and maximize existing space. And an external strategy might include collaboration with other museums. An example of this type of partnership could include lending the piece to an institution that encourages interactive or hands-on learning for children or the seeing impaired Strategies reinforce transparency by demonstrating museums proactive commitment of accountability to stakeholders and to the public. So forgeries are tricky and confessing to a significant curatorial mistake can cause donors to reconsider future gifts or worse, run away. Interviews with museum professionals demonstrate two strongly opposing points of view regarding the exhibition of fakes. One side argues that the glorification of fakes is abhorrent and such objects should never be exhibited. And the other insists that creating the best museum experience is the priority regardless of the content of a specific show. So what happens when an object that's discovered to be a forgery but was, cre but was created by the hands of a world renowned artist is found. So the MFA ran into this. In 1957, uh, they purchased a 10th century Chinese landscape painting. And this painting was exhibited for three years until the artist Zhang De Chen announced to, during a visit at the MFA, that he had made the painting. So he was considered one of the greatest modern painters of the 20th century and built a reputation as a gifted painter a tenacious collector and master forger. His forgeries have deceived top tier museums such as the Smithsonian, the Met, and the British Museum. But however, in 19, I'm sorry, in 2007, 50 years later, the MFA presented a show of his work titled Painter, Collector, and Forger. And this exhibit featured his original work, uh, pieces from his own collection, and several of his forgeries. So 
Designing educational goals surrounding these fakes should be uncomplicated and straightforward. Objectives should focus on examples such as public awareness, methods of discovery, similar fakes, and provenance research. A commitment to outreach and awareness will create the platform where metrics can be applied to the programming. And in addition to exhibitions, lectures, essays, and presentations surrounding the fakes can really reach a wide audience and offer valuable feedback for the museum. This is one of my favorite fakes. No longer should this revelation be considered a weakness or a curatorial aberration, but an opportunity to initiate a public discourse on the event. Museum professionals must remember that art forgers are not only talented rogue artists, but masters of exploiting human desire. Whether it's a development officer cultivating relationships with future donors or the perfect old master falling into a curator's hands, the human psyche can muddy our sensibilities. Instead of blaming those involved and burying the problem, we just need to make it a talking point. And the time is right for us to do that due to the sheer magnitude of the situation. Hans von Migren, Mark Landis, and Ken Perini represent just three of the world's great forgers throughout history and who have employed their expertise in this field. Each of these artists captured the market with a significant body of forgeries, and some of which are still disguised as authentic works of art. Don't forget that. The counterfeit business continues to remain enticing, lucrative, and very accessible. It's an industry that's not restricted by geographical boundaries, and it's impervious to social class, gender, or ethnicity. So I'd like to thank everyone for listening to uh, my my presentation, and uh, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone, and thank you to the CMSMC for the opportunity to present this paper. When visiting the Louvre Museum, you may very easily be struck by Paolo Veronese's monumental painting, The Wedding at Cana. Yet an equally striking aspect of the work is its provenance, found on the museum's website, where the Louvre declares it was acquired by way of military conquest. These words reveal an interesting dichotomy in the field of museum studies today. On the one hand, a critical lens has been turned towards provenance research with valid criticisms pushing museums to critically re-examine their collections. On the other hand, the creation of heritage in modern nation states through military conquests is closely linked to the rise of museums and many collections reflect this. Spoils of war being put on view by victorious armies is nothing new to art history. In these images, you can see the bronze horses removed from St. Mark's Basilica being paraded through Paris in 1798. Now, as we re-examine museum collections and their provenance, where do these objects, these material remnants of war and plunder fit in? Most visitors don't think twice when viewing the Napoleonic plunders still prominently displayed at the Louvre, but we all have much more visceral reactions to images like these. The legal and ethical debates over returning works stolen by the Nazis have taken center stage in media coverage and discussions of museum ethics and rightfully elicit strong responses from viewers. Throughout this talk, I ask you to consider the question of how we approach the complex debate over military conquest as a way of accessioning works into museum collections. I will begin by providing a very brief and overarching summary of the historical context which led to Veronese's wedding at Cana being transported from Venice to Paris. Due to the limited time available and the complexity of the period, I will of course not be able to cover it in detail. If you're interested in a much more in-depth account of the historical context of theft of the painting, I highly recommend Cynthia Saltzman's Plunder, which goes into much more detail than I will be able to cover here. Finished in 1563, 
The Wedding at Cana is a monumental painting largely recognized as Paolo Veronese's masterpiece. The enormous canvas was created to fit one of the walls of the refectory of San Giorgio Maggiore with several pieces of cloth sewn together to create a single canvas. This particular painting would have adorned the wall above the abbot's table, watching over the rest of the room and its occupants as their meals mirrored the subject of the painting. After the fall of the French monarchy and the reign of terror, Napoleon Bonaparte, a Corsican general of Italian origin, embarked on a highly successful Italian campaign. His troops swept through northern Italy, arriving in Venice in May of 1797. It did not take long for the plunder of art to begin, and one of the works high on the list of their desired art was the wedding at Cana. In October of 1797, the Treaty of Campo Formio ended the Italian campaign and shifted control of Venice from the French to the Austrian Empire. It should be noted here that this removal of French power from the region was met with mixed receptions, reflecting, uh, excuse me, reflecting different views on what constituted Italian heritage and who should be seen as either a protector or a destroyer of it. The writings of Ugo Foscolo, a renowned author sympathetic to the French Republic, reveal the complexity of the response to Napoleon in Italy and reflect the sentiments of many young Italians. In his Ode to Napoleon, he praises the French general by giving him the title of liberator of the people. In his earlier works, the French army is neither threat nor foe. Instead, Foscolo frames them as a new age dawning on the dark ages of tyranny that have loomed over Italy. Just a year later, however, in his 1798 novel, The Last Letters of Jacopo Ortiz, Foscolo shifted away from this high praise. In one of the fictional letters, the titular character refers to Napoleon having betrayed the people of Italy, who had awaited his liberation by turning over Venice to the Austrian Empire. The shift from liberator of the people to traitor is dramatic and speaks of the rapidly changing views and alliances throughout the Napoleonic Wars. In 1804, Napoleon abandoned all semblances of Republican values upon declaring himself emperor of France. It took the united forces of several European states to eventually defeat this growing French empire, resulting in the Congress of Vienna in 1815. One of the central issues discussed during this time was the return of the hundreds of works looted under Napoleon's direction from the European states he had conquered and invaded. The Italian sculptor Antonio Canova, previously employed by Napoleon himself, was sent as an emissary from the Pope to ensure the return of the artworks taken from the Papal States. He found an opposing force in Vivant Denon, the first director of the Louvre, who was desperately trying to retain as many works as possible. While, while the Papal States had an ardent spokesperson in Canova, the city of Venice lacked the same power to advocate for the return of their stolen art, as the city remained under the control of the Austrian Empire. All in all, 258 of the 506 works of art looted during the Italian campaigns returned to Italy, including 15 of the 18 works taken from Venice. The wedding at Cana was among those kept in France, with French officials citing its large size and fragile state as reasons to prevent its transportation. This decision made by French and Austrian diplomats was not received well by Canova. His answer to the proposed exchange had been that, quote, I would never have betrayed the interests and honor of my country nor ever approved of such an exchange. Napoleon proclaimed the right to remove Italian art from Italy because of his belief that France was the true heir of the Italian Renaissance. He was not stealing works from Italy, but rather returning stewardship of them to their deserving descendants. This idea is echoed in a song written for the Fête de la Liberté in July of 1798, when Italian art was paraded through the streets of Paris, which states, quote, Rome is no more in Rome, it is all in Paris. The ideals of the Italian Renaissance and the Roman Empire had passed on to France. Italy as it stood in the late 18th century was not a deserving heir and thus had relinquished its right to retain the material culture of those periods. When arguing that France fabricated an imagined heritage which gave it the moral obligation to store the works of art stolen by Napoleon, we must also consider the claim that Italy as a modern day nation state is an entirely separate entity from the states that happened to fall within its borders before unification. Considering this, does the Republic of Italy have any more right than the Republic of France 
to lay claim to works created by and for a state that no longer exists. It is important to note here that while Italy is an entirely modern nation, the idea of a shared Italian identity is far from it. Over 500 years before the Italian campaigns, the Renaissance poet Petrarca lamented the strife and war ripping apart God's, quote, beloved and noble country. Other renowned Italian figures alluded to Italy as a whole, encompassing all of the fractured city-states within the peninsula. Giacomo Lopardi, a contemporary of Ugo Foscolo and Napoleon, mourned in his poem to Italy the loss of Italian soldiers who had died fighting not for their fatherland, but for a foreign force. Most of these issues harken back to the role that museums play in constructing heritage. In Making and Remaking National Identities, Flora Kaplan explains that, quote, museums are more than the sum of their parts. They played and continue to play important roles in creating national identity. The Louvre became a physical space within which to display and create a new French identity through the use of older material culture. Even though many of the works assembled for the Louvre visually represented or had close historical ties to the values that the Republic did not support, their presence in the Louvre helped cement the Republic's right to rule. The building itself, once royal palace, had its physicality and its meaning morphed to legitimize the new government and provide it with adequate prestige. The Congress of Vienna was far from the last time that the Louvre was subject to calls for the return of looted Italian art. In 1911, an Italian immigrant in France, Vincenzo Perugia, walked out of the Louvre with the Mona Lisa tucked under his arm, motivated by his misguided beliefs that the painting was stolen and belonged back in its home country. The crime was praised by many Italians, including the renowned Italian author Gabriele D'Annunzio, who allegedly wrote to Perugia personally to praise his actions. The painting was eventually returned to the Louvre, but not before being paraded through the museums of Italy. Much like the Mona Lisa, Veronese's wedding at Cana is not a work that can be easily moved or let for exhibitions. The painting was only removed from the building on three other occasions, twice due to war and the third for a much needed conservation. Its longest departure from the Louvre began in 1939, as the Louvre feared the imminent invasion of German forces. This fear was well-founded as the Nazis were some of the most efficient art thieves in history, emptying churches, museums, and private collections as they swept their way through Europe. Much like the discussions that took place during the Congress of Vienna, the end of World War II was met with calls for restitution. One of the guiding principles of these efforts was the idea that works sold or exchanged under duress or military threat did not constitute a legitimate exchange. By these standards, the purported trade of Venetian art to Napoleon and the subsequent exchange of works negotiated between two invading forces, France and Austria, would be identified as an invalid exchange. These discussions on the validity of sales and removals of art during war are therefore neither new nor unique. The recent conversations on decolonization have placed a much needed spotlight on the ethics of provenance and the importance of provenance research. Recent blockbuster publications, such as Dan Hicks' British Museums, reveal a growing interest in, the academ in academic circles and the public on exposing and revising the histories of museum acquisitions. Museum standards for acquisition and accessioning have changed significantly over the centuries since the Louvre first opened. Napoleon's systematic theft of art from the ter territories he conquered is clearly not an acceptable form of acquisition today, and similar modes of acquisition have been criticized or undone in recent decades. The question of whether past figures should be held to modern standards is complex and goes beyond the scope of this paper, yet modern museums can and should be held to following those standards. Museums and their collections are not frozen in the past, but are rather continually changing and growing in response to audience needs and professional standards. Critics will often cite the enormity of the process needed to reassess, deaccession, and revise collections. Yet after time and adaptation, the same controversial or seemingly impossible tasks become standard practice. One of the central tenets of museum outreach is trust in the museum, both from the public and from other institutions. A museum cannot truly accomplish its mission if, the, if it does not have public trust in its integrity and in the information it presents. One key way to not lose this trust is to re-examine the history of its collections and provenance and apply its contemporary standards for accessioning to its already existing collections.
Interestingly, Napoleon himself commented on the ethics of plunder during the Italian campaigns. In Napoleon, the path to power, Philip Dwyer highlights several instances when Napoleon had to punish or plead with his troops to end pillages, destruction, and looting. When he arrived in Rome in April of 1796, he reprimanded his troops on the looting taking place throughout the city. Addressing his soldiers, he added that, quote, looters will be shot mercilessly. Several have been already. This clearly stands in stark contrast with the state-sponsored looting that Napoleon himself oversaw and encouraged. For his soldiers, plunder is vile and punishable by death, while for Napoleon, it is not only acceptable, but it is his duty. Where once the wedding at Cana overlooked the meals of the Benedictine monks of San Giorgio Maggiore, today it watches over the millions of visitors who pass through the Louvre every year. Its placement directly in front of the Louvre's headlining masterpiece, the Mona Lisa, means that in most cases, the painting only sees the backs of its potential audiences. Numerous arguments could certainly be made for the right of the Louvre to hold and display this work. The history of collections acquired through military conquest is neither new nor unusual. Such provenances can be found throughout the collections of museums worldwide. The Louvre could undoubtedly also claim that as a victorious commander, Napoleon had every right to remove spoils of war from Venice, and that the Congress of Vienna secured France's right to retain the wedding at Cana. Yet while this argument has a solid legal standing, we should consider the ethics of acquiring works through military conquest and the way in which they reflect museum ethics and missions. I want to end this talk with a quote from Dr. Lisa Yun Lee, director of the National Public Housing Museum. She teaches us that, quote, at some point, the history of your institution will disappoint you. Tell this history and take responsibility for the past. Begin to make amends and restore justice. Museums and societal standards change over time, and museum collections and provenance work should reflect that. Change of this magnitude is always overwhelming and seemingly impossible at first, but as has been evidenced in the past, gradually becomes more standardized and accessible. To revise this place of military plunder in collections such as the Louvre is not to call for the tearing down of a global institution, but is rather asking a leader in museum studies and art history to present the highest standards of provenance ethics. Thank you. Hello everyone, and thank you for joining me today at the CMSMC Symposium. My name is Abigail Eplett, and I graduated from Tufts University, the Museum Studies program earlier this year. My talk today is going to be about propaganda created by American anti-slavery societies for the American abolitionist movement. I'm specifically going to be focusing on early posters, which were also called broadsides, and other print marketing tools. Before we begin, I'm going to start you off with a quick introduction to how we think about propaganda today versus how people thought about it in the 19th century. Um, this change of view happened because of the 1948 United Nations Conference on Freedom of Information. During this, uh, during this conference, representatives from all around the world, uh, like Eleanor Roosevelt, whose pictures you see on the right, made international rules on what could and could not be published. Prior to this conference, the word propaganda did not have negative connotations. It was a neutral term. It was used for all influential material produced by countries and political organizations. However, after this conference, propaganda was divided into bad and good. Bad propaganda was banned and is still currently banned by the UN. It defines bad propaganda as, quote, designed or likely to provoke or encourage any threat to the peace, breach of the peace, or act of aggression, end quote. However, uh, the UN does promote its own propaganda. Uh, it considers this good propaganda, but it does not define its materials as propaganda, rather as the truth. So when listening to this talk, 
one thing I want you to think about is what defines propaganda as being good versus bad, both through our modern lens and through the lens of the time where 19th century propaganda was being produced. When it comes to the marketing of the American abolitionist movement, the main distributor of propaganda was called the American Anti-Slavery Society. It was founded in 1833 by a pair of abolitionists, William Lloyd Garrison and Arthur Tappan. This society advocated for the immediate ban of slavery. William Lloyd Garrison remained the leader of the society throughout his existence. He was a writer, editor, lecturer, newspaper owner, and often the face of the American abolitionist movement. His rhetoric appealed especially to white, middle and upper class Northern reformers. Uh, however, his privilege and the privilege of his fan base um, had a very specific slant to how they viewed anti-slavery and abolitionist issues. In contrast to Garrison was Frederick Douglass. Like Garrison, he was a writer, editor, lecturer, and newspaper owner. However, he was born enslaved and escaped as a young adult, uh, where he became self-educated and joined the American Anti-Slavery Society. While he was highly active in Garrison's Anti-Slavery Society, they had great differences in opinion over how they would market the movement. So many tools were used to market the American abolitionist movement, but today I am focusing on broadsides, which were 19th century posters. I have noticed three distinct features of anti-slavery broadsides that makes them a unique form of mass media. First of all, these broadsides were encouraging abolitionists to break the law, both the Constitution and the Fugitive Slave Act. Secondly, these broadsides use the same designs as other 19th century ephemera or um, short-lived publications, which included slave auction notices and other pro-slavery publications. Third, these broadsides promoted a white savior complex through stereotypical in imagery, which appealed to Garrison's followers. So starting off, what were some of the laws that these broadsides were encouraging abolitionists to break? While abolitionists supported the end, end of slavery, they re did realize they were supporting an anti-constitutional viewpoint. In Article 4, Section 2, Clause 3 of the Constitution, also called the Fugitive Slave Clause, it states that no person held in service or labor in one state is permitted to escape into another. If this person is found, they are delivered back to the state from which they came to the household of their master. Now, not everyone, of course, believed that this constitution was meant to support this fugitive slave um, clause. Frederick Douglass argued that this was the incorrect interpretation. In fact, this interpretation was mean, contemptible, and underhand. He argued for an anti-slavery constitution, saying that this clause had applied specifically to indentured servants who had been of European and North African descent, not in any way related to the current slaves living in the South in the early 19th century. However, it is unclear whether Douglas actually believed this viewpoint. He would have known that many of the Constitution's signers were slave owners, including, among others, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. Instead, Douglas was likely setting a precedence for future anti-slavery laws. If these laws surrounding slavery were ruled unconstitutional, then a law against slavery itself would be easier to pass. Uh, however, the laws got a lot worse before they got better, despite Douglas's arguments. For example, in 1842, the Supreme Court ruled in Prigg versus Pennsylvania that state laws protecting free Blacks from kidnapping was ruled unconstitutional 
as it clashed with that fugitive slave clause. Eight years later, in 1850, the situation grew more dire with the passage of the Compromise of 1850. Created by Whig Senators Henry Clay and Daniel Webster, this compromise included the Fugitive Slave Act, which abolished all state laws protecting free Blacks from kidnapping. As a balanced measure, California was admitted as a free state. The slave trade was abolished in the District of Columbia, even though the ownership of slaves was still permitted. And for whatever reason, Texas gave up land for $10 million, uh, which this land became states such as Oklahoma, Arizona, and New Mexico. In response to this law, the Underground Railroad grew exponentially. This organization was an open secret in the North uh, as abolitionists worked together to defy the Fugitive Slave Act, aiding African-American freedom seekers on their journey from the South into the Northern US and Canada. Neighbors turned a blind eye to many abolitionist activities. In fact, many neighbors became pro-slavery because of the passage of this law. This is especially seen in Boston in 1854, when an interracial riot erupted with hundreds of both black and white protesters taking to the streets after the capture of freedom seeker, Anthony Burns. At that time, the streets would have been lined with these 19th century broadsides proclaiming the evils of slavery. But what made these broadsides so popular as a means of defying the law? In the 1820s, new technology allowed for the mass production of printed materials at a scale that had never been seen before in the Western world. Broadsides were an early form of mass media, much like Instagram, Twitter, and Snapchat are today. They were informative or political in nature, advertising an upcoming event or highlighting a recent law. Besides abolition, these issues included drafting during the American Civil War, women's suffrage, and protests during the Industrial Revolution. Broadsides are considered a form of ephemera. That means they're intended for a single use, so not a whole lot of them survive today. Uh, this is unlike printed memorabilia, which were meant to serve as a keepsake. Broadsides have several distinctive elements. Now, this is a rare two-tone broadsides. It was printed in both blue ink and red ink. Most broadsides were printed in black ink. However, this is a great example of multiple design characteristics. One important characteristic of a broadside were those giant fat face fonts. These fonts were invented in 1803 by a man named Robert Thorne who lived in England and very quickly moved across the pond to be used on broadsides throughout the United States. There were many different fonts on one poster to make it very bold and eye catching. Often there was imagery on these posters this one was made by a technique called chromolithography, which is why we get these beautiful colors. These images were meant to catch the attention of passers-by. Often this imagery was very patriotic and dramatic, perhaps appealing to your Christian sympathies as well. The language of these broadsides was also very dramatic to hold the attention of passers-by. It's over the top and militant in courage and rebellion. It mixes facts with exaggeration. You'll see the line in the middle, whoever refuses to bow down to this monster must be killed. Now, many abolitionists were also pacifists, so it is doubtful uh, that the average abolitionist would have killed a person, but it certainly gets the point across. Additionally, this was a one-time use poster, so the paper is cheap not glossy like many modern posters, and the material is printed on only one side. One interesting note about this design is that it was popular for both pro-slavery and anti-slavery broadsides. They appear very similar from the distance, so closer inspection is required to understand the motive of the author. As you can see, both of these posters utilize fat face fonts and several of them. 
there is a mix of facts and exaggeration. They're printed on sheet paper and only printed on one side. Note that these particular broadsides do not include imagery. They would have been less expensive copies made of cheap black ink on inexpensive paper. However, imagery is so important to the American anti-slavery movement, so I'm going to discuss that separately right now. You may recall at the beginning of this presentation, I noted a divide between the white abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison and his followers and the black abolitionist Frederick Douglass. The imagery frequently draw, draw, is drawn from the perspective uh, of the white abolitionists, specifically that only saintly white people can save the downtrodden and perhaps heathen black population. Some common problems with this imagery include what is called smug self-congratulatory attitude by Phil Levinsensky in his graphic discord, abolitionist and anti-abolitionist images. There is no representation of black control, self-assertion or violence in these images. This is Nat Turner erasure, uh, not acknowledging the contributions of Nat Turner, who led a slave rebellion in 1831. It also includes stereotypical and frankly, very gross representations of blacks in some cases. Uh, this imagery is generally divided into two categories. There is journalistic imagery, which tries to represent facts and allegorical imagery, which might focus on a biblical theme or themes from mythology. So some journalistic images might include the cross section of a slave ship first published in 1789. This is an early infographic that shows how tightly Africans were pressed into the cargo holds of slave ships and is very familiar to many historians today. They might also include the detailed punishments of slaves, auctions, separation of families. The, the white abolitionists were very keen on representing violence against black bodies in their imagery. Other imagery might include a specific event such as the mob assault at Prudus Crandall School for, Girl, for Black Girls in Canterbury, Connecticut. Um, in contrast, sorry about that, we are having a slight technical difficulty here. Let me just pause and I will fix that. I apologize for the interruption and we are back. We're going to be talking about allegorical images now. Algal images constantly portrayed helpless slaves, cruel slave overts, and angelic, very Christian abolitionists. One famous image is Josh, Josiah Wedgwood's kneeling slave cameo. He initially showed an image of an African-American man, as you can see on the right, um, but this was extended to also show a woman. This was commonly printed on um, broadsides and almanacs and other print materials, but it was later extended to collectors, medallions, and coins. This Im image is often surrounded by the text, am I not a man and a brother, and am I not a woman and a sister? C cartoons might have shown political figures, such as Frederick Douglass and William Lloyd Garrison, abolitionists, and representations of industries such as cane, cotton, and values, liberty, and truth. Consistently, these values were portrayed as being white women dressed in white, shining like angels, um, standing among the masses of black slaves. These, these images often came in layers, as is the case in this political cartoon. <laughs> 
you'll be able to see many familiar characters that I have touched on earlier, such as a representation of liberty. Frederick Douglass, a slave catcher, William Lloyd Garrison, Daniel Webster, a helpless slave named Susanna portrayed in a caricature, and the, the trod upon US Constitution. So a quick summary of my talk. What are your thoughts on anti-slavery propaganda viewed through our modern lens? We know that the American Anti-Slavery Society led American abolitionists in creating broadsides and other abolitionist content, which encouraged law-breaking, mimicking the style of pro-slavery contemporary documents, journalistic and allegorical imagery supporting a white savior complex. What the, was this propaganda good? Encouraging human rights and equality as stated by the UN through our modern lens, or was this propaganda bad? Encouraging a threat to peace and leading the country into the civil war. Perhaps our modern lens of viewing propaganda is more nuanced than the current laws would suggest. So this is the end of my talk. Thank you so much for listening to my presentation on anti-slavery broadsides and the marketing of American abolitionist movement. I look forward to answering your questions during the Q&A and I will pass it on to our next speaker. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Paulson, and the title of my presentation today is Take Heed of Revelations, Puritanism, Spirituality, and Mental Instability in the Case of Dorothy Talby. A big thank you to CMSMC and all the presenters who presented before me. Your presentations were very fascinating. And before I begin, I would like to give a brief trigger warning for my presentation. In the next 15 minutes, I will be discussing topics such as the murder of a child, domestic abuse, discussions of mental health framed in Puritanism and colonial attitudes, as well as the treatment of physical punishment and execution as a public spectacle. It is Salem in the year 1638 and Dorothy Talby is on trial for murder. Talby was the first woman executed in Massachusetts and the third woman executed in the United States in the year 1638 for the murder of her three-year-old daughter difficulty. While this is not the first case of child murder in early America, Talby's case is significant due to the controversial nature of the court's ruling in favor of her death, especially when considering, considering her mental stability. This presentation is a deep dive into her life, her trial, execution, and what we can get from that. Uh, John Winthrop's journal, as well as many other primary sources, provide a look into the interconnected nature between mental illness and spiritual delusion in Puritan societies. In this presentation, I argue that the murder of difficulty Talby is an often overlooked but important case study that provides evidence of the public nature of Puritan society, Puritan views on mental instability, how the court system worked in early America, as well as how important material sources are to the study of history generally. And on that note, I would like to briefly go over the primary source materials I will be looking at in this case. Uh, like I said, this is an often overlooked case. In the secondary source materials, it is often very briefly mentioned by historians. The two main secondary sources I used were Women Who Kill by Ann Jones and an article about the history of the death penalty in Massachusetts by Alan Rogers. However, this Dorothy Talby it was a secondary character in the study of early America and the death penalty. Therefore, I gained much of my information from these primary source materials. For example, I'm looking at journal articles, specifically John Winthrop's journal, as well as court, the records and files of the quarterly courts of Essex County, Massachusetts. I also did a deep dive into various church records, which I'll get into more later, that recorded things such as baptisms, marriages, and deaths. In addition, I looked at law codes. At this time, in Massachusetts, there was no formal law code. This case takes place in 1638 and the Massachusetts Body of Liberties was a, the first legal code of the state and it comprised a list of liberties, was not officially compiled till 1641. However, it is unlikely that many of the laws would have changed 
especially in regards to murder, in the three or so years between this case and the Body of Liberties. So I will be using that and looking retrospectively. In addition, the Bible was very large. It played a very large role in the court system. And so I will be looking at that as well. There was no separation of church and state at this point. Oops. Finally, before I dive into Dorothy Talby, I just wanna give some brief context on Salem, Massachusetts, um, in case you are unaware. It's officially founded in 1626. And at this time, John Winthrop, pictured on the screen, is governor. Specifically, we're looking at when he was governor during 1637 to 1640. And finally, before I begin, I would like to emphasize that this is not a case of witchcraft, which is so commonly associated with Salem. The Salem witchcraft trials did not really begin until approximately 1692. As I said, this case takes place in 1637, 1638. Uh, Dorothy Talby was not on trial for witchcraft. Nowhere in the primary sources say that she was a witch. Um, she was on trial for murder. She committed a crime and was therefore punished for the crime that she committed. All right, Dorothy Talby was born Dorothy Rollinson and she was born in Lincolnshire, England in 1598 and was baptized in the same year. On November 14th, 1619, she married John Talby in Threckingham, Lincolnshire, England. Presumably she moved to New England sometime in the early 1630s. It was difficult to tell specifically when. However, I believe that he came to New England some, sometime between you know, 1633, 16 to 1636, because in 1636, we have uh, baptism records of her daughter difficulty, which are on the screen now. As you can see, these are records from the First Church of Salem, 1636, and you go down, difficulty daughter of John Talby was baptized on this day. Now you may be thinking, okay, difficulty is kind of a, uh, it's a strange name, especially from a modern perspective, but it was not strange for the Puritans. So you can see on this list, there are many other names directly to the right of difficulty. We have somebody named exercise, that same list, we have someone named experience. So these were not uncommon names, even though difficulty seems like a poor choice in name in retrospect. Um, finally, before I really dive in, this is the main source of evidence I'm using. It's from John Winthrop's journal and the highlighted portion is the paragraph that talks about Dorothy Talby. She's an overlooked figure in history as well as in the primary source material. So I really had to do some digging to find out more about her. Um, in my presentation, I will be using quotes from this specific passage and the edition of John Winthrop's journal um, titled The History of New England will be the edition from 1908, the Barnes and Noble publication. Um, as you can see, I have an excerpt of that on the screen currently. In her early life, Dorothy Talby was considered by many to be a devout Puritan. She belonged to Salem's church and according to John Winthrop, she was a woman of good esteem for godliness. However, she often fell into periods of what Winthrop calls, quote, melancholy or spiritual delusions, highlighting his explicit acknowledgement of her mental instability before the crime took place. Talby had a history of unstable behavior, which I will get into later, but Winthrop in court documents highlight. Not only did she deal with periods of melancholy, but she also dealt with spiritual delusions. In these times, Winthrop reports that, quote, she sometimes attempted to kill him, her husband, and her children and herself by refusing water, saying it was so revealed to her, end quote, by a voice she believed to be God. From this example, it's clear that Winthrop understands that there was a reason behind her actions, Talby acted in this way because God was telling her to do these things. The Puritans considered melancholy to be disease of the mind and body. Uh, in early America, melancholy was often responsible for such spiritual delusions. And the person who was experiencing melancholy often believed that these delusions were coming from God. Therefore, though Winthrop does not specifically make this connection, Talby's er early spiritual delusions were likely a result of her melancholy. In April, 1637, Dorothy Talby was on trial for physically assaulting her husband, John Talby, but she never showed up to court. According to these court records, which are on the screen, the magistrates presiding over her case declared that Talby, quote, for frequent laying hands on her husband to the danger of his life and condemning authority of the court would be chained to a post being allowed only to come to the place of God's worship until she repents, end quote. This punishment not only highlights the emphasis on visibly shaming sinners in Puritan societies as being chained to a post as a highly public act, but also the importance of repentance. She would only be able to gain her freedom when she confessed her sins and asked for forgiveness. In the time after this punishment, the church leaders admonished her for her actions. 
and tried to help reform her. However, Talby stated that she didn't need the church to communicate with God. She could communicate with God in other ways, and she left. After that, she was officially excommunicated from the Church of Salem. Winthrop emphasized that this was one of the main reasons that Talby's morality continues to decline. Religion played a large role in maintaining one's morality and good character in Puritan societies. In the year that followed, Talby became more unstable. In July 1638, which is the image on the bottom, the court records from Essex County state that she was, quote, whipped for misdemeanors against her husband. Whipped, whipping was not only a disciplinary action meant to dissuade Tabby from her crimes, but they were also a warning to the onlookers that the same would happen to them if they strayed from salvation. Both religious and domestic life were issues to the community. Puritans were a largely communal society. Therefore, these, when somebody committed a domestic or religious offense, they were enacted publicly for all to see as a type of warning. In the time after her whipping, Winthrop reports that she, quote, was reformed for a time and carried herself more dutifully to her husband, thus illustrating his belief that it worked as a method of spiritual and mental reform. For this short period between July and November 1638, Talby did not publicly act out. It's important to acknowledge here that Winthrop and the community likely believed that they were helping Talby. They were not doing this out of cruelty or... However, from a modern perspective, we can see that these, are three, these examples are very um, unhealthy ways to treat mental Ill illness and likely only exacerbated Talby's symptoms. In November, 1638, she broke her 30-year-old daughter's neck, difficulty. Winther wrote that she, quote, was so possessed with Satan that he persuaded her by his delusions, which she listened to as revelations by God, to break the neck of her own child, that she might free it from future misery, end quote. As I stated earlier, the Puritans believed that spiritual delusions were a symptom of melancholy. At this point, Salby, Talby still thought she was hearing the voice of God, but Winthrop and other Puritans interpreted she was hearing the voice of Satan and thus succumbed to sin and temptation. At the beginning of her trial, the next month in December, 1638, Talby stated that she murdered her daughter to save her from further misery. After that admission of guilt, she remained silent, quote, till the governor told her she should be pressed to death and then she confessed to the indictment, end quote, once again. However, Winthrop does not mention whether Talby begged for forgiveness in front of the court. He specifically notes that she would not give testimony of her repentance either then or at her execution later that month. Throughout her judgment, quote, she would not uncover her face nor stand up, end quote. Since repentance was one of the cures for spiritual problems that led to sin, this signals Winthrop's belief that Talby was perhaps beyond salvation. She admitted to her crime, but she did not beg, and she did not ask for forgiveness or repentance. So there's this kind of concept that maybe she couldn't have been reformed. Maybe at this point, she was already too far gone. According to the Massachusetts Body of Liberties, um, line four, quote, if any person commit any willful murder upon premeditated malice, hatred, or cruelty, and not in a man's necessary and just defense, not by mere casualty against his will, he shall be put to death. And after this, list three Bible verses, Exodus 21, 12, Exodus 21, 13, and Numbers 35, 31. The Puritans used the Geneva Bible, which was a version specifically from 1599, and I have a page of that on the screen here. Here are the quotes that are listed in the Massachusetts Body of Liberties after the, um, after the line about murder. As you can see, uh, that they uh, basically are saying that if you kill a man, you shall be put to death. Winthrop frequently draws from the Bible, specifically Exodus, as evidence for his court ruling. Dorothy's sentencing follows similar biblical principles. Unlike in modernity, there was no insanity defense that Talby could invoke to decrease her sentence severity. While well, Winthrop clearly understood that she was talking to Satan, the law was clear in this regard. In 1638, there was no legal differentiation between ordinary criminals and people who are mentally unstable. In December 1638, she was executed. Winthrop's description of her hanging further emphasizes the communal part of Puritan society. Public, public hangings were a spectacle that drew large crowds and Talby could be used as an example to the community. In the aftermath, her pastor, Mr. Peter, gave a quote, exhortation to the people to take heed of revelations and of despising the ordinance of excommunication as Talby had done, for when it would have been denounced against her, she turned her back and would have gone forth if she had not been stayed by force, end quote. 
Though the root of Talby's instability was likely her melancholy, her mental state declined because she'd removed herself from Puritanism and left the church, therefore isolating herself from the help of the church and the community, and thus opening herself further to the possibility of satanic delusions. When the Massachusetts Body of Liberties was compiled in 1641, it included this clause upon the screen, quote, children, idiots, distracted persons, and all that are strangers or newcomers to our plantation shall have such allowances and dispensations in any cause, whether criminal or other, as religion and reasons require, end quote. And it's difficult to speculate on, on whether or not this would have helped Talby and saved her from her execution. This was published three years after. Though melancholy was recognized by the Puritans to be a disease, she had still committed a serious crime. Regardless, even if this had had the potential to save her, it came three years too late for Talby. In conclusion, the case of difficulty and Dorothy Talby is an important case study that examines Puritan views on mental instability. I've argued that Winthrop's response highlights how he believed mental instability to be something that could be cured by religion, frequent confessions of sins, and repentance. And through Winthrop's observations, I can make broader generalizations about how they viewed mental instability. From this, we can see that the it highlights the visibility of punishment in early Puritan societies. It acts as a deterrent for community members, as well as a method for religious salvation. In addition, while melancholy was recognized as a disease, crimes that were caused by melancholy or the spiritual delusions caused by melancholy were still punished by the court of law, at least in 1638. Finally, there is this big interconnection, interconnection of religion and Puritan law, as well as the influence of the Bible on early American court cases. There's no separation of church and state and the Bible was often used as evidence. Finally, I would really like to highlight the importance of archival material and primary sources in history in general, as well as specifically regarding to this project. As I said earlier, Dorothy Talby's case is not often talked about in secondary sources. So it was through these primary sources and archival material that I was able to look at her case. Thank you so much, everyone. Excellent. Thank you so much, Elizabeth and all of our speakers. We'll actually be staying on the topic of Salem, but moving to a later era with our keynote speaker. It is my great honor to introduce today's keynote speaker, Rachel Christone. Rachel holds a BA in history from Clark University and a master's degree in history museum studies from Tufts University, where she focused on the history of witchcraft. Currently, she serves as the director of education for the Salem Witch Museum in Salem, Massachusetts, a position she has held for the past six years. She wears many hats at the museum, including developing programming, such as a discussion with Gregory McGuire, the author of Wicked, as well as a variety of lectures on historical witch hunts, such as Japanese internment. In 2017, she began working to update the timeline of witchcraft history for the museum's exhibit, which is Evolving Perceptions. Updates began with new color-coded panels, but eventually included expanding the collection with objects like a first edition of L. Frank Baum's The Wonderful Wizard of Oz and a larger exhibit renovation. Rachel created a new tour and narrations for the three tableaus within the exhibit, including altering one tableau set to reflect newer scholarship. After many years of hard work and shifting gears due to COVID-19, the new exhibit opened on July 6, 2020 to the public. Rachel and her colleagues' work continue as they work to update the entire museum in the coming years. Without further ado, please join us in welcoming Rachel. Thank you so much. So I'm going to share my screen. Alrighty, hello everyone. Uh, I'm so pleased to be with you here today and I am truly honored to have been asked to be the, uh, to give the keynote address for this year's CMSMC Symposium. Uh, my name is Rachel Chris Doan, as you just heard. I am a graduate of Tufts University's master's program where I received my degree in history and museum studies. Uh, I began working at the Salem Witch Museum in 2015, and I have been the Director of Education since 2017. Throughout both my academic and professional careers, my focus has been largely on the history of witchcraft, with a particular emphasis on the evolving image of the witch. So I came to Salem uh, the way so many do, completely by accident. 
Uh, basically, early in my undergraduate career, I was looking for work in the museum field, and I had an interest in gender history. And beyond that, I had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do. Uh, I applied to many, many museums throughout Massachusetts and eventually was hired at the Salem Witch Museum. And of course, I've been there ever since. At the time, I planned to stay for just a summer. Obviously, that would not ultimately be the case. So today we are going to be talking about Salem and the strange place it holds with public memory. Now, as I'm sure many of you know, Salem uh, is famous for the witchcraft trials that took place in 1692. Now, for most people, if I asked you to name a historic witch trial, Salem would almost certainly be the first or possibly your only answer. Now, notably, there have been other witchcraft trials in New England before those that took place in Salem. The largest, the second largest witch hunt uh, before Salem took place in Hartford, Connecticut between 1662 and 1663. During that witchcraft outbreak, 13 people were accused of witchcraft and four people were executed. Now, in contrast, in 1692, uh, over the span of just four months, 19 people are hanged and one man is tortured to death. In addition to that, approximately 150 people are accused of witchcraft. Salem was the largest and by far the most intense witchcraft panic to take place in colonial North America. In the years that followed the witchcraft trials in Salem, Salem almost immediately becomes a metaphor. It's used to criticize those perceived to be acting in an irrational, prejudiced, or illogical manner. And these events would be referenced again and again and again during critical moments during our national, um, during our nation's history as time goes on. Now it is during the 20th century that Salem develops a tourism industry. And that of course continues to be the city's main economic driver to this day. People travel to Salem year round. And though of course the highest rate of visitation is the fall, they come for many reasons throughout the year. Some come to Salem because they're interested in colonial history, or perhaps they read The Crucible in high school. Some are interested in author Nathaniel Hawthorne and the rich maritime history of Salem. However, the ever-growing majority come not because they have a burning interest in 17th century history, but because they love the contemporary witch and all that this figure represents. So for this reason, Salem poses quite a unique challenge for those of us who work in public history. Salem is, of course, a case of dark tourism. This phrase, as I'm sure many of you know, refers to places known for tragedy and suffering that have become sites for contemporary tourists. Now, notable examples of places that can be labeled dark tourism are sites like prison museums, like Alcatraz places where massive disasters have struck like Chernobyl or sites of extreme violence like the Lizzie Borden house. Now Salem of course is unquestionably a site of dark tourism, but I would also argue it's an extremely unusual example within this field. Though thousands were executed for the crime of witchcraft in the early modern period, the witch lingered with us in popular memory and slowly evolved in popular culture. Due to the scientific revolution, illnesses, disasters, misfortune, and so on, were less and less attributed to the work of witches. And slowly, the belief in witchcraft as a real and pressing danger slowly disappeared. Now, eventually, stripped of the fear surrounding this figure, the witch became defined simply as a supernaturally powerful person, almost always portrayed as a woman. So I do a lot of work with groups of at the museum. And when I start presentations, I almost always like to begin by posing a seemingly simple question. What does a witch look like? Now, living in 2021, this is almost always what first comes to mind for us, right? Nine times out of 10. This is, of course, the Wicked Witch of the West from the film The Wizard of Oz. We might call her a stereotypical witch. She's got all the characteristics we in the modern day tend to associate with the witch, right? She has a pointed hat, she's got a broomstick, she has green skin. Or perhaps what first comes to mind for you is the children's story Hansel and Gretel, the witch in her candy covered house who's trying to lure children in so she can cook and eat them. 
Now for many as well, a figure like this may come to mind. This is of course Hermione Granger from the Harry Potter series. A couple of months ago, I did a workshop for a teen library group in California. And when I asked them to tell me what they think of when they hear the word witch, they all unanimously said Hermione Granger. So for this reason, the interpretation of the Salem witch trials poses some very unusual challenges. How do we talk about a figure with a simultaneously horrific past and an adored present? Now, before we go any further, we do need to take a step back and consider how tourism first came to Salem because it's quite an interesting transformation in and of itself. To quote historian Marilyn Roach, what's particularly fascinating about Salem is that in this case, the tourists came before tourism. In the second half of the 19th century, travelers began arriving in Salem. These people were interested in literary legend Nathaniel Hawthorne, who lived and worked in Salem, but they also wanted to know more about the witchcraft trials. So here on screen, we have an article which was published in 1892 in the Newborough Daily Journal. And here we see one gentleman describe his journey through Salem. Now he notes, according to a local hack driver, quote, you have no idea how many people in passing through Salem stop off between trains and ask to be driven about to the places of interest. They all want to see where the witches were hung and they all want to see where Hawthorne lived, end quote. So here's an image of the first visitor's guide published in 1880. This guide describes various aspects of Salem's history, including several references to the Salem witch trials. Now, notably, since 1692, Salem had transitioned um, from an important center of maritime tr trade to a primarily factory-driven city. The factories in Salem produced textiles, shoes, and boots, and this was the main economic driver of Salem during this time. Though, Salem, um, though tourists were arriving in Salem with an interest in the city's witch-related history, there really wasn't a lot for them to see at this point. However, in 1914, a devastating fire breaks out at the corn leather factory, and it destroyed 1,376 buildings and led to 18,000 people losing their homes. As a result, Salem is never able to recover as a manufacturing industry and an economic void opens. Now, it's important to also consider the cultural shift in the perception of the witch that was simultaneously taking place. When legal witch trials came to an end, the witch remained prominent in folklore, artwork, and children's stories. While at first, witches were typically depicted as kind of evil, villainous monsters, think Hansel and Gretel and Rapunzel, the two images I have on screen here. As time goes on, the witch begins to take on new characteristics and qualities. Here are a few images produced in America in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And as you can see, by this time, witches were slowly becoming visually coded in new and very different ways. These are witches from Halloween postcards, from advertisements, and uh, broadly from pop culture. Here we see witches who are good, they're beautiful, they're glamorous, they're even uh, literally the heroine in a children's story. Now a far cry from the legal definition of a witch, the original definition of a witch, from this point onward, the witch would continue to evolve and change and would begin to take on many different new meanings and characteristics, gaining more and more popularity as time goes on. Though Arthur Miller uh, had once drawn national attention to Salem's witch-related history with the premiere of his play, The Crucible in 1953, the association between Salem and witchcraft became an even bigger sensation in 1970 when the popular television sitcom Bewitched came to film on location in Salem. So for those of you who don't know, this show told the story of Samantha Stevens, a beautiful witch who falls in love with a mortal man. The couple get married and she tells him she is a witch on their wedding night. The show then follows their married life as she continuously tries and obviously ultimately fails to give up her powers and be the perfect American housewife. So already known for its witch-related past, when Bewitched filmed a series of episodes in Salem and the surrounding area, which was known as the Salem Saga, the connection between Salem and the pop culture witch was amplified on a national scale. 
If Salem was not the witch city before, from this point onward, the connection could not be broken. Notably, this period is um, when the shift in the image of a witch really explodes in American culture. Samantha Stevens is literally depicted as the girl next door. So by the 1960s, witches had become such beloved cultural figures, they could be cast in the role as America's sweetheart living the American dream. At the same time, witches enter into the realm of comic books. The Scarlet Witch is born right around this same time, the 1960s. Um, and now, of course, the Scarlet Witch is even more uh, relevant to us today or popular with us today because of uh, WandaVision, the television show which recently premiered. This figure is introduced into the Marvel world in 1964. And again, here we see witches being cast not only as good figures, but literally as superheroes. And I chose to use this cover because here we see the Scarlet Witch fighting Cotton Mather, which I think is just endlessly hilarious. Um, it's definitely something that warrants a whole study of its own. But anyway, this exists in case anyone was wondering. So uh, notably around this same time as well, again, thinking about the 1960s and the 1970s, the neo-pagan movement is taking off in the United States. For those of you who don't know, neo-paganism is an umbrella term which refers to individuals who drew inspiration from older earth-based pre-Christian religions, and they update these practices for the modern day. So diving into the history and emergence of Wicca and spiritual witchcraft is a bit beyond the purview of this talk today. But what's essential to consider is that the witch becomes literally uh, a religious identity and a an symbol of empowerment during this period as well. Now in 1971, Lori Cabot arrived in Salem and she opened the city's first occult store. Gifted with a flair for publicity, Cabot made headlines again and again and again, and was even later deemed the official witch of Salem. So this occult sh shop sparked a new surge of industry, attracting practitioners of the witchcraft religion, as well as those interested more generally in New Age spirituality and the occult. As a result, national attention was directed towards Salem once again, and yet another definition of the witch became permanently connected to the city. Salem became and continues to be a kind of haven for those who identify with the witch as a means of spiritual contentment. So let's now consider the question of the hour. How do museums and cultural organizations in Salem teach this history? So this is essentially a constant struggle. It's a push and a pull. There are many places that work very, very hard to respectfully engage with the legacy of the witch, connecting the past and the present witch together. There are those, of course, who are less concerned with respecting the past and instead focus entirely on what modern audiences want, not to name names, but it's places that produce slogans like, I got stoned in Salem and so on. And these are places that of course deeply upset those of us who work so hard to keep the events of 1692 in sight. However, I'm going to be focusing on one particular cultural organization, the Salem Witch Museum. For obvious reasons, this is the organization I know best, but this museum is also unique in that it's one of the few, uh, it was one of the first institutions in Salem to be devoted to the story of the Salem Witch Trials. So the Salem Witch Museum was founded in 1972 in a beautiful historic structure. This building was constructed between 1884, or excuse me, 1844 and 1846, and it was originally the Second Church of Salem. In 1956, the Second Church reunited with the First Church and the building was sold. It was actually next home to the Salem Auto Museum and Americana shops until a devastating fire erupted in 1969, which damaged, damaged much of the museum's um, interior. Three years later, after extensive renovations, the Salem Witch Museum opened its doors. One of the most significant issues at the time of our founding was the question of artifacts. There are very few artifacts that remain from the Salem Witch Trials. The court documents and a handful of objects that belong to individuals involved in the events is really all that we have left. These artifacts are, of course, very delicate and thus require a rigorous and very expensive collections care program to maintain, and that far exceeded our abilities at the time of our museum's founding. And beyond that, 
travelers arriving in Salem expect, expect to see objects that are grim and shocking, such as the gallows, which people were hanged upon, or the gavel used during the court proceedings. Those are really things that were asked for all the time. And those are simply objects that don't exist. So the question was, how do you create a museum without artifacts? The idea behind the Salem Witch Museum was to create a place where anyone could come to learn about the witch trials. Clear, straightforward, and understandable for a variety of ages, it was decided an audiovisual presentation using dioramas would be the best way to convey this story. Visitors enter a large auditorium space, the lights go down, and a low commanding voice walks them through the events of 1692. The main exhibit was created in 1972, and while we're currently in the middle of updating this presentation, including adding new figures and new tableaus, updating the narrative to bring the story in line with the most recent scholarship, et cetera, it's kind of amazing to see how well this format has done with time. To this day, we are still the most visited museum in Salem. Now, by the 1990s, the Salem Witch Museum had grown as an organization, and we realized that the witch means something very different to each person, and that's particularly true for the people who are traveling to Salem. As a result, in 1999, we added the exhibit, Witches Evolving Perceptions. This exhibit focuses on the evolving image and legacy of the witch, as well as more broadly, the European witchcraft trials that predated Salem. Now again, the trials and tribulations of a historic building. This second exhibit room was originally a storage space. It was basically a large closet. It's a considerably smaller room than the main presentation. Uh, and for this reason, this space posed some considerable challenges when we decided to turn it into an exhibit. But with a little bit of creativity, we've made the space work and it's given us the chance to further our mission statement and grow as an organization. This has become a space where we can slowly dip our toe in the waters of adding artifacts. While we do feel a presentation format is an extremely effective way to teach this history, we do hear that same old criticism time and time again, visitors want to see artifacts. And this is another place, again, where we kind of get to get a little creative. Since 2018, we have begun to build a small yet robust collection. These objects are primarily related to the intellectual belief in witchcraft in the early modern period, as well as the evolving image of the witch. We currently have a first edition of the wonderful Wizard of Oz on display, along with several artifacts related to the history of magic. We plan to add, fingers crossed, next year maybe, uh, a 1600 edition of the Malleus Maleficarum to this exhibit as well. This book is an extremely important text, which drastically impacted the trajectory of the European witchcraft trials. So of course, we're very excited to get that into the exhibit on display. Possibly the most important part of our museum, however, can be found in the second exhibit room towards the end of the presentation. We conclude with a formula for a witch hunt, fear plus a trigger equals a scapegoat. This exhibit offers three examples that fit this formula, each from 20th century American history. These are the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II following the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the McCarthy blacklists of the 1950s during the Cold War, and the scapegoating of the gay community during the AIDS epidemic. This presentation asks our visitors to think about the events of 1692 and draw connections beyond the 17th century. Though witch trials often feel very removed from our lives today, these patterns of behavior, such as the tendency to scapegoat and to give into mob mentality during times of great fear, these are ones that unfortunately tend to follow us through human history. Again, this exhibit was created in 1999, and from the day the exhibit opened, we would have visitors walk up to staff at the end of the tour and say, you know what you should add to this wall? X, Y, and Z. In response to this feedback, in 2017, we began to ask our visitors to fill out a blank formula and give it back uh, and give us examples of what they think fits this pattern. At the end of the exhibit, visitors have the option to take a postcard or they can go to our website and they can fill out this blank formula. On our website, uh, under history and education, we now have a database where you can see the hundreds of responses we have received over the past several years particularly in this day and age when the term witch hunt has become increasingly common in news media, 
This exhibit has allowed us to better engage with the public and to ask them to tell us how 1692 relates to our world today. Now here is where the Salem paradox, where we can see the kind of Salem paradox at its finest. Now I ask you to imagine, it's nine o'clock PM on Halloween night. You are giving a tour of this exhibit. Every single person in the room is dressed in costume, including yourself. And these are people of all ages from five to 90. And your group arrives at the witch hunt wall. Now it's relevant to note that our museum does not change during the month of October. It's exactly the same presentation. And you are leading a group of people consisting of people who came to Salem specifically to celebrate Halloween. Many, maybe even most, arrived in Salem without reading ahead of time what the museum offers, and therefore they were expecting some sort of haunted house. This is again, where Salem is a supremely unique example of public history. When I worked as a tour guide, I gave this tour hundreds of times. I worked Halloween night every year, and honestly, it was usually a lot of fun. As I'm sure you all know, this is the busiest time of year for Salem by far. About 500,000 people travel to Salem just in the month of October, and Halloween weekend is by far the busiest time. Most people are in a good mood and they're excited to be in Salem. They're excited about Halloween, they're excited about the pop culture witch, and they want to have this fun autumnal festival. Now, of course, we do face plenty of frustrating people and situations during the month of October. I certainly won't deny that. However, it's really interesting. Uh, the really interesting part about this month is that it exposes people who normally would not come to a museum or would not be interested in the Salem witch trials to a piece of extremely important American history. I have met many people who leave evening tours in October and stop to thank us and tell us that they learned something important. You really haven't experienced Salem to its finest or to its fullest, I should say, until you've had an in-depth discussion with somebody dressed like Bob Ross about Joseph McCarthy, the Red Scare, and the con connections uh, to contemporary American society. Now, I won't try to claim that every single person who comes through our museum in October has an educational epiphany, but the fascinating part about this time of year is the diverse audience who arrive in Salem, open to new experiences and willing to try everything that Salem has to offer. Now, Salem, as I have said, is a very odd case study indeed, and this is primarily due to the fact that the word witch means something very different to each and every person. Particularly when discussing Salem in an academic forum, we can forget that when most people hear the word witch, their minds do not immediately jump to the criminal definition of the witch of the early modern period. The witch is a figure that taps into the part of our brain that wants to believe in magic and the supernatural. In Salem today, everywhere you turn, you see a different definition of the witch. It's certainly a challenge to balance this history and to keep the importance of the lessons in 1692 in sight while also engaging with the modern interpretations of the witch. However, the evolution of the witch has given us an opportunity to educate in a way that most organizations can only dream of. Visitors who come for haunted houses and for fun fall activities arrive with excitement in our darkened auditorium and are brought into a story that's frightening because it's true. This unique educational format, at least in my experience, makes this history approachable to an audience that would not normally care about English common law of the 17th century or the unique, unique evidentiary choices that allowed the court of Oyer and Terminer to um, wreak the havoc that it did during the Salem witch trials. For better or for worse, Salem today has become the witch city. And as an example of dark tourism, it certainly is a case like no other. This is part of the identity of the city. And as the witch continues to grow in popular culture, I would hazard a guess, so too will the city of Salem. Thank you so much for staying for my presentation. Uh, and I hope that you all have a chance to visit Salem at some point in the future as the world starts to go back to a little bit closer to normalcy. Awesome. Rachel, thank you so much. I have to say I went to Salem as a little girl and it was the most formative experience uh, and it made me a historian. So please visit Salem.
Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Hope Gillespie and I'm the editor-in-chief of CMSMC. I'm gonna be leading today's Q&A session. So in the next minute or two, all of our um, panelists today are going to turn on their uh, cameras and uh, turn on their microphones and you're going to have the ability to ask them any questions you might have and put them in discussion with one another. While they're getting the opportunity to do that, I would like to just pose our first question, which is a general question for all of our panelists, which is, why is crime and spectacle so enticing to humans? And what is it about all of these topics that make them intriguing? And specifically, what interested you in this topic? So I'm gonna go ahead and start with Laura. Hi, well, I think I, you know, to kind of on the heels of what Rachel was saying uh, regarding dark tourism, I think there's also sort of dark museum going. And the idea of fakes in museums is enticing, it's scandalous, it sort of, it offers the viewer uh, sort of the real housewives of the behind the museum doors experience. And, um, and we, we eat that stuff up. So um, when I was looking for a topic, I'm the daughter of antique dealers. And when I was looking for a topic for my thesis, I really wanted to, I really wanted to find something that could keep me excited for two years <laughs> and, and let me really kind of unpack um, all, the, all the ins and outs of it. So that's, that's why I think it's fascinating. And, and I think most people would agree. Yeah, uh, Libby or Elizabeth, would you like to hop in on that question as well? Yeah, um, I think it's particularly fascinating, especially when we consider kind of the rise of true crime as an interest, especially today. I mean, in this past year, uh, true crime has really risen in popularity as a genre. There are so many documentaries, videos on YouTube both coming out, and there's this fascination of true crime. And I think that then kind of, it, it almost seems like it's always been here specifically uh, in regards to my presentation when thinking about execution and other aspects of crime as public spectacle, people were interested in it back then because like Laura was saying, it's kind of this kind of uh, a place ripe for gossip and rumors. It's kind of like this, oh, wow, what's happening over there? You know, I would never do that, that kind of thing. And people have a fascination with what's different to them and what, and people who have broken the rules in, in some sort of way. Oh, totally. And and Yuma, if you want to pop in about people who break the rules, why that's so exciting and enticing. Yeah, I think for the, you know, related to my presentation specifically, I think there is certainly an element of, I wish I could do that as well. Um, so money is a very tempting thing because it's just a piece of paper and it looks like something that you can make, anybody could make. And, you know, but it feels like there are repercussions to doing that. So you don't really want to do it. So when somebody does it and it becomes a legal spectacle, uh, it's very um, audience friendly, as it were. And the flip side of that, um, in my argument, is that that gets all the attention and the legal apparatus and its framework and assumed sort of vocabulary kind of takes away from certain things. And so it's very difficult for us to resuscitate something that was there prior to the spectacle. And um, hopefully that is something that scholarship can contribute to. Oh, absolutely. And Francesca, I think when we're talking about spectacle, there's nothing more spectacle-like than colonialism, right? Yeah, so I think, you know, one of the reasons um, this topic makes people so interested and so passionate about it is because it, it relates so closely to issues of, you know, our identity. Uh, material culture often becomes, you know, the most visual form of um, of our identity. And when, you know, museum collections are not cut off, separated from the rest of society and the works that are kept within those collections um, say something about the nation within which the, the museum operates, um, the, the sort of the elite uh, part of society that controls that museum. So, you know, when these collections aren't um, ethical, when when they relate to some sort of crime, when they relate to some sort of plunder or theft or element of colonialism, um, then, you know, that, that, that feels almost like a direct attack on people's identity or a direct theft of people's identity. 
Absolutely. And and actually, Abigail, if you want to jump in about talking about identity and, and propaganda and about why that's also such a big kind of topic that is interesting for everyone. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm trying to think of how I will say this in the context of the the question identity and propaganda is such an interesting thing uh, because what people view as propaganda totally changes depending on their ideology their culture and their their personal background uh, and of course one thing i tried to present in my presentation uh, was about how we as modern people having come through the trauma of the world wars and the actions of the united nations we view propaganda in a very specific way uh that is um what we often try to think of as enlightened in contrast of what happened in the past uh but in actuality it still carries those biases of, of eurocentrism and, and centricism and colonialism uh and so uh it's interesting that we can look back and see you know what the american anti-slavery society did in their day was considered by their society to be very positive uh, con contributing to the end of slavery, abolition, uh, the black men's right to vote, um, questionably. Um, and But if you look at it today, we can see from our modern perspective, a lot of what they did was very much upholding that white savior complex uh, where certain ideologies, even though they claim to have the best intentions, was very much patting themselves on the back uh, upholding this white Anglo-Saxon Protestant view of how the world should work, which uh, in turn continues to influence uh, the United Nations and how they view different issues on propaganda. Absolutely. And and Rachel, I think that's a perfect segue talking about white Anglo-Saxon men and, and their kind of, um, their the huge influence that they have over, you know, obviously what happened in Salem and why presenting that is almost, it's, it's, a, it's a gendered his, history issue, obviously, but it's also very much specifically a statement about what it means to be feminine, right, in that period. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the interesting things about um, learning about the Salem Witch Trials, you know, teaching the Salem Witch Trials is nine times out of 10, we so often hear um, in public reaction, in if you look at the scholarship uh, up until I'd say as late as the 90s, it's all blamed on the afflicted girls, right? Those young teenage girls who were hysterical and bored teenagers. And that's, you know, why this whole tragedy happened. And when you really look at the events, the reason why the Salem witch trials happened is because the elite men who were in charge allowed rules to be broken, allowed unusual evidence to be used. They're the ones who accepted spectral evidence. They're the ones who accepted torture. They're the ones who broke rules. Um, and that's why things spiral out of control in the way that they do. So it's fascinating to look at, uh, to zoom in on the historiography of the Salem witch trials, because this is really telling us an interesting story about gender as well, the way that they're perceived as time goes on. And again, that's not a narrative that you start to see changing till the 90s. That's actually one of the things we're actively trying to pull out of our presentation because it was dominant in the scholarship in the 1972. That's how you talked about the Salem witch trials, you know, and that's something that uh, we are really working hard to pull out of the museum step by step. But it's a, it's a fascinating thing to examine in and of itself. No, I, I totally agree. And actually, I kind of want to pivot to Laura for a minute. We have a question about what visitors think about forgeries, but I'd like to open it up to Rachel and Francesca as well, but not only what visitors think about forgeries, but a lack of artifacts and a, a plethora of colonialized and uh, um, stolen and looted objects. So Laura, if you wanna go ahead. And... Um, well, I think again, you know, visitors love forgeries. There was a traveling uh, show that was around a couple years ago. I think it ended up in Springfield, Massachusetts. and. And it was just high, heavily attended um, and great reviews and a lot of the pieces, it, and it was able to bring it up to surface. Were they beautiful, magnificent, cherished works of art? No, but it probably got a lot of people into those doors that wouldn't normally have come in to check, check out the exhibit um, because it allows 
people who've never been in a space like a museum to engage with an art object without feeling intimidation. It's, it's kind of, it's championing the underdog, you know, they got away with something. I want to check it out. Now it's in a fancy museum. And so in, in terms of forgeries, I think that they're, they're, they're a great uh, stream of revenue for museums and should be a little more celebrated than they are. And, and Rachel, as to having very little or specific artifacts, obviously, you know, people ask for them, but how does the narrative of the museum play out without them and the visitor reaction to that? I think it's really interesting because sometimes it's seen um, in the kind of greater museum world as a handicap, you know, being um, a museum that relies on presentations as opposed to artifacts. But what's fascinating is seeing the way that visitors react when they come in. You know, we see people coming into our museum who are not, let's say, the traditional museum folk. Uh, my husband uh, included, you know, he is not a museum person. And he, it's been, we've been traveling the past couple of weeks and it's been really interesting watching him. I've been dragging him in and out of museums, like it's nobody's business. And he doesn't, he doesn't read panels. He doesn't, you know, he kind of speed walks his way through. Uh, he's not a museum guy. And, but the kind of presentation based experiences, that's what'll pull him in. And I feel like that's the interesting thing where uh, we started our museum because, you know, we didn't have a choice. There were no artifacts to use. So we had to pivot. And I think it's ended up being kind of accidentally brilliant. You know, it's ended up inviting people into a space they don't normally feel comfortable. They don't normally feel is a space for them. Uh, it's been really interesting the past couple of, uh, the past year or so, the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem has had the court documents on display, which for those of us who love museums and who love this history has been amazing. If you are ever in Salem, you know, in the next year or so, definitely go check out that exhibit because it's amazing. But again, it's that traditional museum experience where you go in, you see cases, you read panels, and that's not a learning style that appeals to a lot of people. So having an opportunity to teach this history in a different way, particularly this history that's so fascinating and so gripping, again, it gives us an opportunity to reach out to that non-museum going audience and make this history more approachable. And Francesca, with items that are looted and are stolen and are kind of connected with the colonialist past, I think it, it goes into a similar vein as well because most people don't realize that or they don't know, correct? Yeah, um, you know, in, in, in recent, you know, as you were saying, it, uh, it has been really highlighted um, more in recent years with efforts of decolonization um, and more calls for museum transparency. Um, there have been, you know, these headlining cases, not recently even, you know, going back a few decades, like the Elgin Marbles or um, the, the Ben and Bronzes that I mentioned very briefly, um, Dan Hicks discusses in his book, The British Museum. And I think, uh, you know, those cases speak more to the more um, infuriating aspect of, of theft and plunder, which is uh, the one that uh, is vilified, obviously, rightfully so, because it is an elite institution or nation taking art forcefully, um, often illegally and certainly unethically, from a, a conquered or a, an oppressed uh, peoples, whether, you know, there's also, there's also other cases of theft and plunder, which are, uh, are more, you know, exciting, uh, which, as Laura was mentioning, uh, feature more of the, the underdog, the romanticized, uh, the romanticized figure taking from from an elite institution. And I think you know these cases like the Gardner heist, which have recently gained a lot of attention through the Netflix documentary as well. Absolutely, I I think that the Gardner heist in particular, I think is is something that really draws people in. Um, it drew in lots of my family members who know absolutely nothing about museum studies because to them it's shocking that people can get away with this and not get caught. Because how is it possible? These are high profile items, right? But speaking of things that are a little bit more high profile, um, Libby, there's a question for you about why Dorothy Talbot wasn't considered a witch and what the difference between witchcraft and melancholy is. And Rachel, please feel free to jump in um, at any point. But um, why wasn't she considered a witch? I mean, it's mental illness is often equated with illness. And, um, you know, in reading Stacey Schiff's book about Salem, you know, she discusses what it's like 
to have those same symptoms. And obviously we know in, in things like the exorcist, which we, you know, now attribute to mental illness and exorcisms and things like that. Why wasn't she considered a witch? Why was she kind of just called a criminal? Yeah, so I think that's a really fascinating question. And I would attribute a lot of it to, uh, I suppose, the time period of when this is happening. Um, the first person to be accused of witchcraft in New England wasn't until 1647 in Connecticut. Um, and the case with Dorothy Talby takes place 10 years earlier. Um, and the first person to be accused in Massachusetts specifically was 1648. And Winthrop talks about that in his, in his journal. And so I think it does have to tie, it ties in a lot with the time period of when this was happening. Um, but I agree that melancholy and witchcraft uh, are very connected. And a lot of the witchcraft trials uh, from around the world, melancholy was used as kind of evidence to support witchcraft and that actions that may have been done as a result of mental instability or melancholy were often then proof of witchcraft. Um, I would like to point the person who asked this question to this article um, titled Melancholic Imaginations by Claire Bartram, um, in which she considers this point further. Um, and I would also like to pass it to Rachel. If she has any more thoughts on this topic. Yeah, the connection between uh, melancholy and witchcraft is one that's very interesting. But I would also say that it has a lot to do with, I mean, I think that you're completely right in that time period. Um, Carol Carlson has a phenomenal book on women, why women were more acute, uh, likely to be accused of witchcraft in the colonies um, than men. I mean, they're more likely to be accused, generally speaking, but she focuses on the North American colonies. Uh, her book is Devil in the Shape of a Woman. It's an incredible book to read if you haven't already definitely put it on your list. Uh, it's She's such an amazing writer, but she talks about how you know, initially there aren't a lot of witchcraft accusations. Witchcraft accusations don't begin until the colony has really settled down because you're more focused on living. You know, you're focused on getting through the next winter, getting through the next summer. You know, witchcraft is something that it's kind of strange to say, but it can, it doesn't happen until you get out of that survival mode and you can let fears take over in a different way. Uh, so that's kind of part one, but then also we have to think about um, witchcraft tends to be something that uh, those accusations tend to happen when there's another victim involved. Um, so obviously in your case, uh, there's a victim involved in that she's killed her child, but a witchcraft accusation usually happens when, um, you know, it's a, a person who has a lasting uh, misfortune. You know, your, your child has gotten sick, your cow has died, your crops have died, things like that. That's when you start to project a witchcraft fear outward and you start to find someone to scapegoat for that particular misfortune. Uh, so in a case like this, where it's someone who has committed a very specific crime that's really only impacting her bubble, I wouldn't say that even if this had happened in, let's say 16, you know, 70, she probably wouldn't have been accused of witchcraft anyway. Uh, you know, infanticide is a separate crime. Um, you know, it's not necessarily something that would have led to a witchcraft accusation either way, at least unless there was, you know, more going on, you know, another person gets pulled in for whatever reason. Awesome. Um, I actually, I want to pivot to a question that we, we came up with in committee because it ties all of your presentations together. Don't you love it when that happens? Um, so it's about the materiality of all of your presentations, right? Obviously, all of us work with material culture, but how do we display and showcase objects with complicated history, whether they be looted, whether they're fakes and forgeries, whether they're propaganda, you know, in Numa's case, whether they're a signifier of something that is monetary and a signal of almost rebellion in some cases. And I'd actually like to start with Yuma on that. How do we effectively showcase those things in a didactic and fully transparent way? Can you maybe, you know, to enrich in the conversation, maybe clarify your question. Um, do you want to, are, are you asking sort of, in a sense, like a media theoretical question of how, how things and material affect us? Yeah, so, so in in a sense, with with the with the yen notes, how how can those be displayed in a way that effectively narrates their history and makes it clear what they are, but also shows that they have this very deep, complicated past? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I I am in the art history department, but I'm interested in for this purpose um, 
some of the tools that media theorists or media historians employ to look at things as opposed to people doing things. Um, and so if, if people um, have read uh, media theory, there is a German media theory theoretician named Cornelia Wiesmann who talks about the grammar of um, media theory in which people are not only actors who act upon things, but the things actually act upon us as objects, uh, which is a very helpful sort of formulation to think about how media and things are not neutral objects that are passively um, being acted upon, but they are actually grammatical subjects that have impact on us. And so I think money is one of those things that by their existence separate from us, um, they do something to us. They embarrass us, they, they, they threaten us, they entice us. Uh, and so the agency of the material as it were is something that is a productive method, I think, to approach something like this. I, I totally, I totally agree with that. And I think that Abby talking about the th almost the threatening nature of, of the abolitionist posters you're talking about, right? That very much feeds into that if you'd like to take that question next. I can, I can, oh, you guys. About that and some microphone issues. Um, yeah, the threatening nature of the abolitionist poster. I mean, one, one thing, I did mention this in the presentation that I like to see as an equivalent is how broadsides were used in the 19th century is very, very similar to how social media is used today by different politicians, government organizations, and political organizations. So that sort of um, aggressive inflammatory language that we see in modern political figures using, who some of which are now banned from Twitter, um, thankfully, uh, was also being used by printers in the 19th century. So this type of very aggressive inflammatory language seen in the modern era is nothing new. Um, and it also kind of makes uh, me and probably you also think of the nature of fake news and how does the material culture that we see in the 19th century with its um, very um, hyperbole and very excited language tie into the fake news that we see today where maybe we agree with a certain viewpoint, but it is told with such big language and such uh, exaggerated characters that it has gone away from the areas of facts and definitions to some sort of a creative license or a um, uh, allegorical process um, where the opposite party who regards our views or views of a certain group as propaganda, well, we might see it as truth, um, can fight back with their own inflammatory images. Uh, so very much in parallel to different political views of the United States today with their um, social media and their messaging, you can see in the 19th century, the broadsides look almost identical uh, from a distance, but when you come up close, even though the same design, the same language is being used, uh, the messaging is very, very different. Absolutely. And Francesca, when you kind of answer this very general question that we're all going through, there is another question that uh, in summary asks you, you know, with the San Marco Lions, when do they cease to become Turkish and they become French? And I, I think from there we can talk about what is, the, what is the object, how does the object biography influence how we display things, right? Sure. So I believe, um, so I should say they're not actually lions, they're horses. Um, they're bronze horses, but if, if you're not aware of the, the history, um, they were, they were um, stolen from Constantinople uh, in around 1200 CE by the Venetians, and they were brought to Venice, um, and they were displayed on in one of the, the, the nooks of the Basilica in St. Mark's Square in Venice. Um, so then in 1797, when Napoleon invaded Venice, they were part of the, the loot that was taken um, from the city and taken to France. And the, the, 
during uh, the parade of, of the Italian plunder that I, I showed at the beginning of my presentation. So those works were part of the, the art that was returned to Venice after the Congress of Vienna in 1815. Um, and that sparks an interesting comparison because they were, you know, they were returned to Venice after the, the military conquest of Venice at the hands of Napoleon and the French uh, Republic. However, uh, they have this other um, history of military conquest and of looting. Um, and, and as far as I know, um, I'm not aware of any calls for the restitution. And I, I, I don't think that's something that's likely because they have become so ubiquitous with the Venice. They are like the Venetian horses of St. Mark's Basilica. Um, so, you know, that, that, that introduces an interesting aspect of like, at what point is this heritage formed? At what point is material culture, when does it become associated with a specific heritage? Because, you know, clearly now the, the horses have remained in Venice for roughly 800 years, um, which is probably longer than they were in Constantinople, which is now Istanbul, obviously, but, um, we're not really sure when they were made. They could be either Greek or Roman. So I'm not entirely sure of how long they were there originally. While, you know, if we shift to the wedding at Cana, that has been, it's been roughly half and half the amount of years that it was um, in Venice and then the amount of years that it was in France. So, you know, uh, does a specific event like Napoleon's conquest then make an object uh, belong to a specific heritage? So the fact that the wedding at Cannes is now associated with Napoleon's conquest. Does that make it French? Um, so, you know, this is a very complex, uh, complex topic uh, that doesn't have one easy or overarching answer that you can apply to every single case. Because um, obviously you wouldn't say that the theft of, uh, of a Jewish collector's art would then make it German because it was stolen by the Nazis and it's associated with that specific uh, time period, obviously, and rightfully so, we, we, there's been an effort to return those objects. Um, so I think the, um, and I, I apologize for blabbering on so much, but uh, one of the, the, the main tools that a museum can use with these topics is transparency. Um, I know last time I was at the British Museum, they have a room dedicated to telling sort of the history of provenance of the Parthenon marbles. Um, which was an interesting addition to the conversation. I'm not saying that these are exactly like the solution and after that nothing else should be done, but I think they're definitely an important step to take. Absolutely, and, and Laura, when talking about transparency and forgeries, you, you talked about this at the end of your presentation, but is, is there a, a better way? Is there a better way to be transparent when it comes with forgeries? Well, I think you need to provide people with tools to deal with, you know, what they're, what they're seeing. So you, you've clearly labeled a misattribution or a forgery on your museum wall, but then, you know, kind of going back to what Yuma was talking about, this object in and of itself has its own, has its own energy and its own existence in space. And now you've just, you've just changed its authenticity. You've, you've, or subverted it. And, and what is the viewer now to do? You know, if someone, told me my favorite Turner was fake that I go and see at the MFA every single time. How does that change my experience with that object? And that's what I think, not just the empirical evidence that you have in front of you saying, hey, this isn't real, but then what the hell do you do with that? I mean, it's kind of becomes this very um, strange question on how we attribute authenticity and oneness and realness to objects, so. I don't have the um, the playbook for how to do that, but I do think it should be talked about so that people can not just walk away and go, uh, what was that? What did I just see? It kind of like being thrown, the viewer is getting thrown a mess of information, right? And how do they, how how are they appropriately supposed to process that, right? And and that's that's a huge issue I think that we're going to face when we move into being exceptionally transparent in museums is how do we make it digestible for an audience, right? And Rachel, obviously working with a narrative that's, that's changing, ever-changing, and has changed so much and making it digestible is, is difficult, right? Yeah, absolutely. Especially when we're talking about something that's as big as witchcraft 
most people who are coming into a witchcraft museum don't really understand what they're talking about. They're thinking about witchcraft in terms of Harry Potter and Wicked and, you know, I want to be a witch with magic powers. You know, they're not thinking about, or maybe they have a vague idea of people being burned at the stake and the Spanish Inquisition, things that are like, you know, tangentially related to our topic. So being able to focus those expectations and being able to talk about something that, as we talked about, you know, the witch is loved in the present day. It's something that I'm not going to look at a, you know, 12 year old girl who worships Hermione Granger and tell her that she's inherently disrespecting the history. She's not, she's engaging with it in a different way. So being able to connect that with this very sad, tragic history is something that it's such a fine, delicate line that we're all walking you know, constantly. And I think artifacts can be very useful in that regard. But again, is that the only way to bring people into that history? No. Uh, is that even the best way? Maybe not. It's something that helps us engage with the topic, but certainly isn't, um, you know, the kind of be all end all to get people to think about this huge and very complex history. Because again, the artifacts that they want to see for the most part, do not exist. If I had a nickel for every time people came in to the museum and asked to see where the witches were burned, you know, it just, it's not something, witches were not burned at the stake in the English colonies. It didn't happen. You know, I can't point you in that direction because it didn't happen, you know? So it's one of those things that it's a very interesting, very hard line to walk, but I think it opens us up to a world of creativity, which is kind of fun and interesting. Absolutely. And Elizabeth, we'll kind of pivot to you for the for the last answer to this question. But for you, talking about the materiality in your cases, it's a little bit different, right? What what you're working with is almost a a familiar materiality, right? You're you're working with documents and you're working with religion, right? And so how is it when you're when you're putting together your presentation, when you're looking at Dorothy Talby, to look at someone who is very clearly something that we would call something else now, if that question makes sense. And how are we truthful to that narrative? Yeah, um, that's definitely something I considered when I was putting together my presentation because it's very difficult to look at this case, um, kind of removing yourself from your modern biases because you look back and you see, okay, well, maybe she had postpartum depression, but they didn't think of it in that way. They they called it melancholy. They, they didn't know of postpartum depression. Um, and a lot of things were understood through this religious life religious light that is uh, uncommon to us. We don't understand law in the same way that they did. We don't understand uh, how mental illness works in the same way that they did. So I think when approaching a case like this and seeing these documents where at first glance, you're like, this is very strange. This is very uncommon to me. You just have to sort of put yourself in the shoes of the people that you're looking at and think to yourself, this was not strange for them. This was normal. This was just how they thought about that. Um, and it's it's a little bit of a challenge when you're first looking into it, but once you kind of overcome that modern bias, that that obstacle, um, it becomes a lot more uh, easy to kind of look through that lens. Absolutely, remembering that all of our subjects, in some way, shape, or form, are human. I think is also the one thing that I can I can at least say for myself that every historian that I know loves about history, because at the end of the day, it's it's a, a uniting struggle that kind of brings us all together. And there are uniting human elements through every single presentation here today. So I wanna thank all of you guys again. Does anyone have any final thoughts before I pass it off for our closing remarks? Awesome. Like I said, you guys have been incredible. Thank you so much. And I'm going to pass it off to Christine Staten for our closing remarks. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Hope said, I'm Christine. I'm a member of the symposium committee here at CMSMC, and I have the honor of closing our program today. So let me begin with a huge thank you to our panelists and to our keynote, Rachel. Your research has been so engaging and has certainly challenged me to think about very familiar topics, but in new and exciting ways. And I also thank all of all of you who came and attended the symposium today and contributed to a wonderful discussion during our Q&A.
So as a brief wrap up um, during today's symposium, Laura Calhoun contributed best practices for the display and management of fakes and forgeries in museum collections, which focus on transparency and accountability. Francesca Bizzi discussed the Italian artworks throughout France during the Napoleonic invasion and the ethics of provenance research. Yuma Terrara offered a more complex interpretation of model 1000 yen note within the context of money art of the 1960s in Japan and discussed how that leads to a deeper conversation on the organization of art history as a field. Abigail Eplett gave us a fascinating presentation that challenged us to consider the difference between good propaganda and bad, bad propaganda using the American abolitionist broadsides as a compelling example. And by considering the case of Dorothy Talby, Elizabeth Paulson reflected on the spectacle of punishment and colonial attitudes towards and methods for curing mental illness in early America. Following today's symposium, we have a social hour beginning at 2.30, uh, where you are all welcome to join and chat with uh, the panelists and the other and, uh, attendees. And Mary-Kate should be sharing the Zoom link in the chat, um, I think, at this moment. If you would like to become more involved with CMSMC or support our mission, please consider joining our Patreon, shopping in our online store, and attending more events with us. Information on all of this and more is available on the CMSMC website. So thank you again for joining us, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. Awesome job, guys. Really, really, really solid. You can go ahead and log off if you want to join us later. Please feel free. Um, I think Mary-Kate and I are going to stay on for a minute to touch base on things, but hopefully I see you guys at the happy hour. You guys are so, so good. They're just, just so good. Awesome job. Francesca, way to hang in there. It was so oh good. Gosh. I know. Okay, so sorry good. about all that. that no, was... you were you were fine. I was just glad that there were no problems like through your presentation. That was Yeah, great. I know. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Of course. Hooray, good job we, everyone. We did it, it got done. I think that's the most difficult one we've